growing your technology business through m and Today we'll cover why an M&A strategy is good for growing your technology business and how to use that tool and then how you do a successful deal. According to a KPMG study in 2017, technology is going to be the most active area for M&A in, in this year. And same as last year. And you can see that technology is far ahead of number two, oil and gas. Why M&A? Quite frankly, you will dramatically increase your revenues, revenues that you can increase faster than any other way. Organic growth is slow and steady, but you definitely can make more in revenues. Um, according to this study done by Harvard Business School, so you have frequent buyers who do one or two deals a year through good and bad economic times, who have an M&A process in place. Basically, they outpace their competitors 2 to 1, 1 1.4 to 2 to 1 in terms of revenue. So if you are going to engage in M&A, you need a solid business strategy. You need a strategy that is derived from your corporate strategy. Because M&A, just like everything else you do, is done to enhance and further that, those corporate objectives and goals to achieve that vision. The most, uh, the most successful deals have very specific goals. It's one thing to say, gee, I think that we need to establish overseas operations. It's another thing to say, we should be in England and Scotland. We should... Uh, target these companies with X amount of revenue that have these Y products that have these Z clients and and so forth and so on. So that level of specificity gets you uh, to success. Also, don't fall in love with your deals. Think car buying when you walk onto the lot and you see a car you love, the salesperson, of course, will pick up on that. And you may not uh, negotiate as hard as you would otherwise to get a better deal. And they probably think that you'll buy the 60-month loan package instead of the 48-month loan package, and they can pocket that interest. So remain objective in order to get the best deal. So we're going to go through both sell side and then buy side. So there are many elements to a successful sell side strategy. You can probably do a day-long seminar just on that, but I have pulled out some of the most important ones, and I'm going to go through those. One thing is to have a very solid understanding of your competition and your market. Know where you stand with respect to your competition. What are the differentiators for your company? If your competition is selling at multiples of revenue or EBITDA, say three to five um, multiples, and you want seven or 10, what are those things that distinguish you from your competitors? And to be clear about that and to communicate that concisely. Also, understanding your value in the marketplace helps you uh, have a realistic view of how much you can sell for if you're a seller. The next one is hiring an experienced team. Now, looking around uh, the table here, uh, I don't think anybody's in a company with um, a standing M&A group. So that means if you're going to do M&A, you hire from the outside. And there's a couple of reasons for this. There's actually many reasons for this. One is you want folks that are experienced in M&A. M&A can be a complex process. And those that are familiar with uh, the process, who have done a lot of deals, these are the people that you're looking for. And I'm specifically talking about legal help and either a great financial advisor or investment banker. Also, uh, these folks, which hopefully have done many M&A deals, have good contacts within the community and uh, 
more often than not can find you uh, buyers. The next one is to have a competitive uh, sales process and what this really means is you want multiple buyers because you want folks bidding, bidding for you and that will increase your price. You're trying to get your maximum price and um, that is a way to do it. There are, there are also auctions for um, companies that have themselves for sale. This should go without saying, but I actually have a very interesting story about this. Uh, have complete books, records, and contracts. In other words, all your paperwork needs to be in order. I was at a conference recently, and um, there was a panel of very experienced M&A folks, and they were talking about disasters uh, and, and big flops as far as deals go. And they related one story. One gentleman was involved in uh, acquiring a company, and they discovered that all their bookkeeping had been done on yellow pads. And so the deal came to a screeching halt at that point. <laughs> Needless to say, it failed. Um, so uh, obviously, um, your accounting has to be uh, verified by an outside party, whether through a recent audit, if you are doing your accounting in-house, or by the accounting firm that you're using. And that, too, should go without saying, but hey, that's why we're here. Lastly, time is of the essence, and this is also uh, undervalued. Any delays can endanger your deal. It's important that you are responsive to um, any buyer communications or requests, and that they are made a priority. Um, if you look like you're not being responsive, or maybe it comes across like you don't care, then you could be um, saying goodbye to that deal. Let's look at the M&A process for sale side. So these are the major pieces of it. Obviously, there's a lot of different tasks that you've got to do, and we're not going to talk about all those today, so you, you'll be out of here on time. But um, for the sales side, it's important that you plan your process, and that's where your professionals, your M&A professionals come in. Also, it's advisable that before you put yourself up for sale, that you want to, um, it's akin to bringing in a home inspector, having them look at your house before you put it up for sale, and perform any fixes before the sign goes out in the front yard. And uh, essentially doing due diligence on your business, and we'll get into what that is in a minute. So um, that means filling in any gaps so that you can get the maximum price for your business. Then as you identify potential buyers, you'll want to contact them to see if there's any interest. You also need, as part of your planning, to establish a data room. And um, these days, they're electronic. So you have all your documentation together in this data room. Um, and that way, the buyer, uh, once you sign the LOI, can access your documentation. And there's uh, tons of software out there for uh, electronic data vaults where you can sequester certain information, like financial information so that only a few people have access to it. You know when somebody's downloaded something and so forth. <coughs> so once you and the buyer ha are in contact, they'll probably contact you by letter for more information so they can put together a letter of intent. This letter of intent is a essentially a deal sheet. It outlines all the major tenets of the deal, the price, the terms, and so forth. If you are a proactive seller, you might end up drafting the purchase agreement proactively. So it's kind of like who gets the jump on the, uh, uh, the purchase agreement because you know what's in there and it's less trouble for you. Um, it really depends on the deal and the people involved. As far as um, due diligence goes, um, once the LOI is signed, Due diligence begins in earnest, and you've got to have the information that the buyer is looking for, in other words, to respond to them in a timely manner with the information they're looking for and to make your people available for interview. If due diligence goes well, then you're going to negotiate and sign the deal. 
let's talk about buy side or acquisition side. So there are a number of strategies and these are six common strategies that we're going to go through and uh, I've got charts on each one of these. So let's talk about how you improve a target company's performance. Private equity, better private equity firms do this very well where they find a company that has low margins and low return on investment. And um, say your operating margin is like 97%. So um, your expenses are 90%, 97% of your revenues. Um, not very good. So uh, let's say that uh, you as the PE company, you buy this company, usually at a low price, and you go in and you cost cut. You don't need to put in any more money. You just make their operations more efficient. Let's say you can get that operating margin down to 94% or 91%. So you've doubled and tripled your revenue. You have increased the value of the company and you sell it. Removing excess capacity from the industry. Right now, in this area, there are a lot of IT service firms. There are too many IT service firms. And they're operating at low margins. The best thing to do is to have some mergers in this area so that that excess capacity can be taken out of the market so that everybody who's left standing can make more money. Accelerating the market for the target or buyer's products. Two examples here. Let's say you have a small pharma company with an innovative product, but they have a small sales force. They can't get around to all the doctors, the clinics, the hospitals that they know could use their product big pharma company comes along with a large marketing and sales force. They then buy the smaller company and can use their large marketing and sales um, uh, group to introduce that product to um, a much bigger market so that they can take advantage uh, of much more of that potential market. Um, IBM did this. Uh, in a four-year period between 2010 and 2013, they bought 43 companies at about $350 million apiece. And um, they accelerated their revenue, in certain cases, up to 40% within the first two years of owning them. If you can't uh, build it and has to, it sometimes makes sense to go out and buy it instead. Um, Apple bought Siri in 2010. Uh, a personal assistant software. And then in 2014, they purchased Novaris Technologies, um, a speech recognition uh, technology company to enhance Siri. Um, who knows how long it would have taken Apple to create these capabilities in-house. And of course, uh, they were foresighted. They saw how to put this together, and then everybody else copied them, including and especially Android. If you recall, after the recession, all of the airlines were bleeding buckets of money. That includes United and Continental. Uh, in 2009, United uh, lost uh, $1.1 $1 .1 billion. United lost $282 million. Um, uh, United bought Continental in 2010. And they estimated that they could save a $1 billion by combining a number of their back office um, uh, processes, including administration, um, plane servicing, and so forth. So that's where you're seeing um, a very powerful economy of scale being realized. Seeking winners early and helping them develop their business. Today, Hip and knee replacements are commonplace. Everybody knows somebody, and usually several somebodies, that have undergone this, this procedure. Um, major in the lives of a, a single person, but commonly done. Um, in 1998, not so. Johnson & Johnson bought Dupe. A, uh, they make artificial joints, like um, in this case, a uh, hip joint there or knees. And they saw the possibilities there. They had $900 million in revenues in 1998, Dupuy that is. Um, and by 2010, they had revenues of $5.8 billion, about 17% average increase per year. So they saw them, they nurtured them, 
and Johnson & Johnson is riding that nice wave today. But you have to have patience, and you have to have foresight, and you have to know how to nurture a smaller business to bring them along. So those are six growth strategies. Let's look at buy-side M&A process. You can see that all the major steps are the same, but some of the activities are very different. On buy side, basically you're going to be, based on your strong uh, strategy, you're going to be looking at targets and you're going to be assessing targets. And if you're in the market all the time, you're going to be assessing targets all the time. You identify those targets and then maybe one to a handful, you're going to approach them to see if there's any interest in selling. And if there is, and it progresses to that point, you're going to draft the letter of intent and um, negotiate that with the seller. Once you have identified those targets and approached them, and uh, the LOI has been negotiated and signed, then due diligence starts. And as the buyer, you're taking the lead on that. And you're working various areas with the seller and we'll get into more about due diligence in a minute. Um, and you are also in parallel with due diligence, performing your due diligence, you're starting your integration plan. Your, the integration plan um, will detail how you merge the two companies, and we'll also get into more about that in a moment. And if all goes well, you sign the deal, the acquisition plan, sorry, the, ac the acquisition or purchase uh, agreement has been developed, it's been negotiated, and you sign the deal. Let's talk about due diligence. So due diligence is that investigation of the company that you're about to acquire. And very often, I would say most of the time, that while essential, it's essential to do the legal and the financial due diligence, sometimes people don't go beyond that. These are essential, but they are not sufficient in order to really understand what it is you're buying. Due diligence is all about um, understanding the other company and understanding what you're getting and making sure that you do not overpay. In order to perform comprehensive due diligence, you have to widen your purview. Many people think that you need experts in each one of these areas in order to do your first round of due diligence, and that's not so. You really just need to understand the right questions to ask and the right people to talk to. Sometimes subject matter experts do need to be brought in if you find serious problems in an area so that you understand what it will take to address those areas moving forward. And so these, these problems equal costs. Thus, your initial offer is contingent upon what you find in due diligence. So just to take some examples here, as far as your acquisition target, the items external to that are its political and economic situation. Back to my example about um, establishing overseas um, operations, if you're doing business in other countries, you're going to need to understand the political and economic climate of those, company, of those countries. Let's talk about cybersecurity. Bill referred to the Verizon Yahoo deal. It turns out that Yahoo wanted to knock a billion off the price for Yahoo when they first, uh, when these um, uh, uh, breaches first came to light. There were two major breaches. Um, but it, they wanted uh, Yahoo, and um, that billion dollars became about 340 million, about 7% of the deal when all was said and done. However, if you didn't do that due diligence in that area, you wouldn't have known about it. And, uh, you would have paid too much for that company. Social is reputational. You want to know if your target has a contingency plan. Five days after you buy somebody and they have a big problem, you want to know that they can handle it. 
you don't want to see the value of the deal that you just consummated go down because they didn't have a plan in place. Let's go to internal areas. Most of the time, the management is checked out, if only in a cursory manner, but you really want to understand their capabilities, their experience, and so forth. Huh? And who you're going to keep. That's it. Let's talk about operational here. This is an area that is often overlooked. What we're talking about here are processes that are product specific, that support, uh, product or service specific, that support um, the major business and also managerial processes, as well as the tools that support um, uh, getting those processes done. Very often, this is an area that is underestimated. Um, we're talking to a client right now who last year wanted to merge two internal businesses. You would think that that would be a very straightforward thing. Well, they thought initially that their integration process would take them four months. When we spoke with them, they were in month five of a 16-month integration cycle. And what that means is, is that they had to put out much more money to get that integration done than they thought they would, that it took them far more time, four times more time than they thought it would. And that means that they cannot realize the benefits of uh, that merger for that much longer, or at least not the full benefits. For supply chain, marketing and sales, and customer service, along with everything else, these can be areas of hidden synergies. So it's, uh, due diligence is not always about discovering the negative. It's also discovering the hidden gems. Um, let's say in technology, uh, besides the products that you know about, they've got some other things in work that can also provide greater value to the deal. You want to know about those things. You don't want to discover them after the fact. You want them in your integration plan so you can put them to work more quickly. So for these reasons, you want to look at these areas. Now, for every deal, you're not going to look at all these areas. Some of them are not appropriate. But the idea is that you walk in with your eyes open and you decide which areas are appropriate for your deal and you have the people lined up that can take a look at these areas. If red flags are found, then you decide whether you're going to bring in um, specific expertise to um, more closely evaluate that, or it becomes a deal killer. You're done. Nice to meet you. We'll see you later. Or whatever it is that you need to do. Something that we haven't talked about uh, this morning is export control. If you are thinking about uh, having operations overseas, and you've got uh, specific products, especially anything defense or aerospace related, export control becomes a daily part of your life. And that, that's a whole other specialty in and of itself. Having dealt with that in the past, I, I uh, used to work for the Boeing company, and I worked on a launch vehicle program, and we had Russian, Ukrainian, and Norwegian partners. And um, we, we got very familiar with export control. Okay, finally, let's talk about the integration plan. Basically, this is how all your major resources, assets, your processes, and any commitments that the mutual companies have will be combined. And for larger deals, it's not only a document, it's a set of documents. The more accurate your integration plan is, the better you understand your deal. And the better you do, uh, the more thoroughly you do due diligence, the better your integration plan is going to be. And also, the integration plan will show you, guide you as far as the money, the people, and the time it's going to take you to integrate your two companies. So in, in the case of my unfortunate client, um, where they had so vastly underestimated their integration time, they got a bad surprise. So obviously their integration plan um, was not complete. And they only made these discoveries after they had merged the two companies. And you know, you, you don't want to be there. So last chart. Um, 
Our company does provide M&A strategy, due diligence, and integration services. We provide a 30-minute free consultation. If you're interested, please contact me.